I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Damian Patrick Williams, a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. So in general, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot and uh, trying to really just get a sense of, of recent has been, um, you know, where technology especially fits into all of the problems uh, that we've been seeing, the various protest movements worldwide, um, the various kinds of tracking, uh, a little bit, you know, everything that's been going on um, and just trying to get a sense of how it is that what we try to deploy on a technological level kind of tends to exacerbate a lot of the problems or helps us to to get a better sense of those problems, to really see them in a different way that we maybe wouldn't have been able to see uh, before right now. Um, And so one of the things that I did pretty recently was there was a talk that we gave a panel discussion on um, technology and anti-black surveillance at Virginia Tech. And so we got several of the scholars at the university um, you know, current graduate students, recently graduated PhDs, and one faculty member to really just kind of talk about how our research has really shown us the ways in which these things have, have persisted over history and are also extraordinarily current in this present moment. Um, and one of the things that I kind of focus on is something that I've talked about before is like the, the way that surveillance technology and specifically facial recognition technology kind of really exacerbates um, anti-black bias and uh, various kinds of racialized bias and and how it gets used definitely, but also just in how it's constructed and how it's been constructed uh, down through history. And so the, you know, question of how did this tool come to be formed? How did it come to be uh, conceived of in the way that it currently is? And how did it come to be you know, then deployed out into the communities where it's deployed uh, really kind of helps us think about this question of when we are talking about using facial recognition on protesters to kind of monitor where they are and who's involved in what protests and things like that, you know, that how that really links back up into um, the history of, you know, counter surveillance, counter protest movements, um, you know, things within the United States, definitely, but within other governments as well. And this whole history kind of connects back up to the history of how policing has been envisioned in the United States and that question of who are the police for, both in terms of who are the police there supposedly to help, but also who are they supposedly there to, you know, quote unquote, catch uh, who are they there to catch in the act, catch at, you know, bad actions. But that then goes back to the question of, again, where do the police come from? 
and the way that police are envisioned in the United States comes from this history of slave catching and it comes from the history of, you know, the retrieval of property and the property in the time of their conception in the United States, the police were patrols for catching property. That was people. They're slave catching patrols. They're you know, people who are sent to retrieve enslaved Africans who had managed to escape <laughs> their masters and uh, were trying to find a path to some kind of freedom. Uh, and these patrols were posses of people empowered to retrieve them, uh, to search the neighboring locality and countrysides in order to find them, and then to, to bring back to the people who quote unquote rightfully owned them. And so this is the kind of uh, crux <laughs> of, of what it is that, that policing started out as in the United States, right? Like this, uh, oh, you, the wrong that has been done against you is that your property has been taken from you or your property escaped. Property, again, being person. <laughs> These people who you had enslaved have escaped from you. Let us return them to you. And then the United States with the passage of the 13th Amendment, um, various things uh, were done to try to make it seem as though this was no longer the case, that you know, enslaved people, previously enslaved peoples, would be you know, regarded as equal um, and that they would be you know, integrated into society. They would no longer be uh, enslaved for various purposes. But as has been discussed often in recent years, the 13th Amendment has a critical exception uh, within it, you know, no human shall be enslaved with the exception of for the purposes of, you know, incarceration or carceral punishment. And so the conversation about how the prison system in the United States then comes to be uh, and comes to be viewed and what it comes to be for. Um, and then the questions, the observations that we can make about um, who is more often prosecuted, who is more often given harsher sentences for you know, what kinds of ranges of crimes, who is more often uh, brought to you know, carceral institutions uh, for extended periods, regardless of the kinds of ranges of their crimes. So this question of... Um, why is it that we see such massive disparities in sentencing for uh, similar levels of you know, nonviolent drug offenses? You know, mandatory minimums for certain types of uh, drug offenses and not for others. Um, this has been something that has been being discussed in the United States since the 1980s forward. Why does crack cocaine get a higher mandatory minimum sentence than powder cocaine when the majority of crack cocaine users are black and the majority of powder cocaine users are white, but powder cocaine is used at a much higher rate than crack cocaine is. These questions begin to form their own answers in a way. And just asking the question, we can kind of see the differences and the distinctions that push forward. But all of that is then this kind of overarching carceral state and this overarching carceral state in which punishment and you know, retribution and incarceration for the sake of labor become the kind of watchwords, become you know, necessities of the nature of what we think of as incarceration proper, right? Um, and so we can talk about how tools such as um, mugshots and tools such as um, you know, physiological diagrams. As they were developed in the late 18th and throughout the 19th centuries, they were developed in such a way that they kind of reinforced a presupposition as to the criminal nature of certain types of people. Right? So think about you know, physiognomy and phrenology as you know, these ideas that have fallen by the wayside, but they're still actually very current in these notions that are being made use of today. You know, this idea that there's a certain kind of way that you can read someone's face or, or think about the, the construction of their features and their, their background, their biology, their physiology, and you can see criminality written in it. This idea is actually very, very present 
<laughs> um, there was a, a very large push just this past week by a group of scholars and researchers and activists to get the company uh, Springer, the you know, academic journal Springer, to not publish a paper which purported to have found using facial recognition algorithms markers of criminality in the faces of various people. This is this is 2020. <laughs> this research was done in 2019, and this paper was going to be being published in 2020. This is not this is not the 1900s. This is not this is not the 1800s. This is now, and this has a direct connection uh, between what we think of as this history of uh, racialized imaging measurement, these systems of, of taking you know, pictures of people, taking measurements of people and saying, well, this kind of person, because of these outward physiological differences, must have these inbuilt character traits, right? Like this history is rife. It, it exists and has existed for you know, literally centuries. And all these various tools have done is to try to use the trappings of science and mathematics to give those prejudices legitimacy. We haven't stopped doing that. <laughs> what we have done is, is make our tools fancier. <laughs> We've made them shinier. We've called, you know, given them the names of algorithms and facial recognition technology and biometrics, right? Like these are these are not better things. They are just the same things in newer packages. So this question of this history and how it all comes to be and, and what we can do about it is something that I've been trying to really get out into the forefront of people's minds for a long time. Uh, it came up in the last conversation that you and I had, um, but it's gained a lot of currency in this moment because a lot of people are starting to really recognize that these tools do have this kind of inbuilt prejudice that if we can look at the history of what happens in a camera and we can look at the history of, of how camera and photographic technologies are built, we can talk about what it is that allows us to see certain features within photographs and not others certain features within videos and not others and then what it takes to render those videos to render those images in such a way that we can see other features so for instance right now we're talking on zoom and if you look at me zoom is uh, the camera that i'm using is directly squared on my face you can see my face very clearly the white shirt that i'm wearing is completely blown out However, if I put my hand next to my white shirt, my hand stays blown out. It is a different tone of skin, my hand and my arm, than the rest of my face and neck, right? That's because Zoom is doing autocorrection. The digital camera that I'm using in my laptop is doing autocorrection on what it thinks is the most important part of this picture, the thing in the center, which is my face. If I were to angle this camera down a little bit and make my chest the main you know, central image, everything else would get washed out and my chest would be much more clearly visible. I can kind of point that wordly and you can see what I mean, right? So all of that detail becomes more in focus at that point for the sake of making the central image, the point of light and focus, the framing, the main thing in the picture clearer. Most of photographic technology that we can look at does this based on what is the brightest thing in the center of the frame. Many different changes have been made of recent to try to focus these things on faces uh, and facial features. But the fact of the matter is, is that if there was a white person standing next to me, my camera would try to render that face first. Pretty much every digital camera would. And it would focus on that face, rendering those details, 
and lose the details of my face in large part because the way that photographic technology has been developed over time is such that it was primarily developed and built for the sake of making sure that white people's faces would be the most visible faces in an image. And then as digital camera technology came into the fore, those kinds of things, again, they weren't necessarily interrogated in any real way. So what happens is that they become assumptions about the quote unquote right way to do things about the right way, quote unquote, again, uh, the right way a camera operates. Um, and so if the goal is to balance and make clear the brightest thing in the room, the brightest thing in the image, then the assumption is that the things that are darker in that image should either be there for the sake of detail at best, or they are simply unimportant and are not meant to be as clearly rendered. Again, we've talked about some of this stuff before, but take this forward again to the 21st century where digital cameras aren't just used for taking selfies or taking group pictures with your friends. That's bad enough, but they're used for the basis of training facial recognition image sets. And those facial recognition image sets are then used for the basis of surveillance technologies. And those surveillance technologies are used by the police and the military and law enforcement. Just this past week, a man was wrongfully arrested based on an erroneous facial recognition match. He was singled out by the facial recognition software as a person entirely different than he was. And the arresting officers didn't question that. From what I'm given to understand, I should say the arresting officers didn't question that. There is a darker possibility, so to speak, and that possibility is that they looked at the picture and said, looks close enough to me in some version of, you know, they all kind of look the same to me anyway. I don't know that that's true. It's a possibility that exists, but whatever reason happened, what happened is that this man was tagged by the spatial recognition system erroneously. For whatever reason, human agents did not countermand that identification and this man was arrested. In 2016, uh, the Georgetown Center for Privacy Technology did uh, a huge, huge write-up called the Perpetual Lineup. Uh, and it was talking about just how facial recognition is like pervasive through American society in ways that are frankly shocking. Absolutely massive report, really extremely well-documented, very good research. Um, Claire Garvey, uh, Alvaro Bedoya, uh, I can't remember the other researchers' names, but just a lot of really good people doing good work in this. Um, and what they found, frankly, uh, fundamentally, was that uh, facial recognition, and this is four years ago, and changes have been made, but not as many as people think, but facial recognition is fundamentally less good on people with darker skin tones for the reasons that we've kind of outlined. They don't really go into the history of digital camera technology within the course of the paper, but they note that it's just it's less good on darker skin tones. It does not work as well. Simultaneously, it is deployed more often in communities of people who have darker skin tones. Creating, and this is me saying this, this fundamentally creates a swath of people who quote unquote fit the description. It digitizes this idea that, you know, they all kind of look the same anyway. So might as well surveil them all more heavily. This notion of the inherent criminality and the need for further surveillance of communities of color then gets turned into this kind of training data for the algorithms that are intended to surveil these people. Many of the 
police and military facial recognition training algorithms, um, they're based on mugshots. And again, <laughs> there is a predominance, especially within certain communities, within mugshot databases of faces of color. What this is to say is not that if we continue to feed them more data in this way, they'll get quote unquote better at it. In fact, it's kind of fundamentally the opposite. Having fed them all of this increasingly biased data, what they have in fact done is gotten worse at it. They have gotten less good at being able to make these distinctions. And so what do we do if we can't just train our way out of this? I honestly think that in a large part, facial recognition technology, it doesn't really have more good uses than it has bad. And the outcomes especially are often not worth the potential good they could do. Um, someone pointed something out to me the other day that I hadn't seen, uh, in India, several thousand missing and runaway children had been identified by facial recognition and by deployment of facial recognition, uh, technology in New Delhi. And I hadn't, I hadn't heard about that. Um, it was fairly recent, but even in that scenario, I have to wonder, are we really prepared for the kinds of further stratification to Indian society that that could create? Like India is a society, a country that is massively stratified in terms of both social class and race and uh, a very entangled mixture of both of those things, right? If you have a technology whereby facial recognition is being used to find children who are assumed to be being neglected or abandoned or in some way, shape, or form underserved, if the use of the spatial recognition is such that you then deploy it in communities where people are already more marginalized, where they're already struggling, where they're already trying to, you know, take care of families, feed themselves, their children, and make sure that their community is, is as whole as possible. If those communities are also of a, an underserved character, if they're already lower class, so to speak, then you've not actually done anything to help those people. You've given further weight to the assumption that, oh, those people don't know how to take care of their children. Oh, their children are, are obviously neglected other children need to be watched over by some outside apparatus because they're obviously not going to be able to um, be watched over by their families their communities etc and so this reinscription of this social expectation of what kind of character these people living in these communities have becomes enforced by the technology as well and so this social belief becomes inscribed and codified and given more support to by this air of scientific mathematical legitimacy, right? The data says we find more neglected children here. The data says we find more crime here. Never mind the fact that the data says you find more crime where you look for more crime. <laughs> that you find more neglect where you look for more neglect. And that neglect is however you categorize it. The different ways that you class these kinds of behavior and these kinds of situations 
and then penalize them is not going to do anything if what the root of the problem is is a lack of resources or a lack of accessibility, a lack of availability of food, shelter, if family members have died and those children are without the ability to reach out to the state to say, hey, we need help here. If that fundamental disparity exists, then creating a facial recognition algorithm that says, look in these poor parts of town for neglected, underserved children (laughs) doesn't help them. If all you're doing is looking to shove them back into the box where they're neglected and underserved. If all you're looking to do is penalize the family members or the children themselves, in some cases, who are trying already, struggling to survive within that framework. It doesn't address any systemic issues at all. None whatsoever. And so this question of how are we thinking about the technologies that we make and how are we deploying them, how are we actually making use of them once they're made, that's something even more fundamental to all of this. Because ultimately, you know, if you make if you make a better technology, for want of a better turn of phrase there, but if you you know if you make a better technology, but you deploy it in the same cultural system, the same society, that's not gonna it's not gonna have the outcome of actually changing that society. If you make a you know a technology that tries to specifically address the facts of that society and that tries to get people to think about the society in which they live and the ways in which they're thinking about deploying these things, that's different. Then you might be able to actually make some headway. You might be able to get people to recognize and understand how all of these things link up. But right now we're still at this point where people are just thinking about making a better technology they're recognizing that the bias is there. They're recognizing that the, the prejudicial attitudes are embedded and can be embedded within these technologies. But the response that they have is to make a better technology. I'm not going to say that's a bad response. I think it's a first step, though. I don't think it's the end of the goal. It can't be. Because it's a values problem. It's an attitudinal shift that needs to happen. Because... If I make a technology that's better at distinguishing black people's faces from a crowd, then if white supremacists and law enforcement decide that they think that's a really great idea because now they can better see the people that they want to target, I've not done a great thing, right? What I've done is give people an easier way to target protest leaders. (laughs) I've given people an easier way to target, you know, the heads of movements, and that's not that's not the goal that's that's not that's not my goal that's not the outcome that i desire here but if we give people a way to think about and recognize the fact that our biases are going to be encoded into the systems and the tools that we make no matter what and to think clearly about the idea that we better make sure they're you know, the perspectives we're trying to encode are the ones we want to be encoding rather than just whatever happens to fall out of us when we're not thinking critically about it. If I can do that, if I can nudge people towards thinking that way, that's the kind of outcome that I think could actually make lasting change. Ultimately, there are a number of people who are thinking this way. There are people within artificial intelligence research, within disability technology research who are who are thinking about these kinds of things and are trying to get us to stop thinking about, you know, fairness. Trying to get us to stop thinking about company ethics and are trying to start thinking about justice and equity. Right. Like, how do you make a just technology? How do you make a society in which the technologies that get created will more likely have an equitable character, where they will not only not exacerbate bias, 
not exacerbate oppression, not exacerbate inequality, but will actually work to redress it, to actually do something to make things more equal and more just. And if we can think about that at a kind of culture-wide level, then I think we can start to actually get some things done. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Since the last time we talked, have you seen any progress in the field in this way? Yeah, I think that there are, there are definitely people who are, they're writing, they're researching, and they're being very vocal about this need for, for this shift. Um, again, you know, artificial intelligence researchers who are doing work on, you know, you know, equity and justice work within the field of artificial intelligence. Um, people like, uh, Os Keys, uh, Rua Williams, um, looking at it from a neurodiversity and disability perspective, you know, thinking about, they're thinking about how we make these technologies with not just, you know, with the person in mind who is oppressed, right? Not just the, the disabled person, not just the autistic person, not just the, the black person, not just women, not just trans people in general, not just, you know, marginalized people saying, hey, come over here and tell me what you think of this, but actually getting those lived experiences to be integrated within the ways that we make these technologies, right? Um, there is a, a paper out there called the, uh, the Crypt Technoscience Manifesto that specifically says, if we think about how we make technologies, not just post hoc accessible, right? Not just after the fact, you know, we'll slap some, oh, you know, we, we put a ramp on it kind of accessibility, but from the outset saying who's experiences should be centered here how do we create technology from a position of disability justice of equity in which it's not just a matter of quote unquote inclusion and diversity but is about actual representation and accessibility within the building and the creation and the design of all of these things so I do think there's been some progress there. I do think there's been some big pushes towards um, this kind of thing. But I also think that those voices need to be amplified. Um, I think that there's still resistance within uh, various technosocial circles to thinking in this way, to thinking in the more systemic way. But I think that, again, the moment that we are in right now where more people are recognizing the connection between systemic racism, um, between systemic prejudice of many kinds, uh, and the nature of the society in which we live and the technosocial aspects of those societies. I think that with more and more people recognizing that, there's going to be an easier time pushing for people making those kinds of changes for those kinds of voices who are already pushing for that to be heard. And I think that, frankly, a lot of us are very tired <laughs> because we've been trying to have this conversation for years. And we've been trying to make sure that this conversation goes somewhere and doesn't get lost for a very long time. And so to have that very suddenly be a real possibility while it is, it's a relief, it is a sense of, of relief for me. Um, there's also this sense of every day while I am doing this research, someone will send me an article <laughs> that fits directly into the scope. And either, you know, whether it's an article that I've already read or an article that I hadn't seen yet, it's, it's another thing, right? It's, it's always, there's one more piece. And while it simultaneously stands as encouraging that more people are coming to recognize exactly how pervasive it is, 
it also stands as a signal of exactly how much more there still is to do. And so having other people who haven't yet been in the fight (laughs) for as long as some of us have, take it up and move it forward. Take the work that's already been done and say, here's a framework. Here are these researchers, you know, again, the, the, te- the Crypt Techno Science Manifesto was in the works for several years before they got it actually done. Um, and it got published, I want to say, last year. Uh, let me find that out just for sure. Um, and it, you know, and that, some of that's down to the, yeah, April of last year. Some of that's down to the, just the slow pace of, academic journal writing in general like it takes time but some of that is also down to the fact that there's just a lot to do um and so uh, amy hamrai and kelly frisch wrote the crypt techno science manifesto it was published in catalyst uh the journal of feminism theory and techno science uh last year april of last year and so they and other people, you know, again, Oskies, Ru Williams, Ruha Benjamin, they've been doing this work for years, o- over a decade in some people's cases, you know, like multiple decades in other people's cases. And so the, I think to know that that work is actually being taken forward into spaces where policy is made, where communities are being organized, where people are coming together to try to forge new ways to move forward. I think that is the thing that could do a lot of people a lot of good right now to show that they're not one to show people who are just getting started, that they're not building this from scratch, that there is work foundational work that they can lean on to get it done. But two, to show the people who have been doing that work and building that foundation that they're not doing it for nothing, that they are being heeded, that they are being recognized and taken up for the things that they have to do. Um, Ashley Shu at Virginia Tech is doing work that just got recognized by you know the NSF in the past year. The National Science Foundation has done, you know, There's a grant that for Ashley's work that looks at technology and disability and says, how are disabled people included or not in the design, maintenance, creation, general thinking about the technologies that they need to use to live? And it takes a lot of work that looks directly at the personal stories of disabled people and how they relate to the the technologies that they use in their daily life. Whether that's, you know, integrated technologies like prostheses or insulin pumps or, you know, uh, the portacath technology that allows for chemotherapy or, you know, whether it's something like, networks online of support groups and the ability to to post blogs and and talk with other people and whether that's people making youtube vlogs about their lived experience like all of these things are technologies that people have to navigate in order to live the lives that they live right the 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 communication system between doctor and patient between patient and you know doctor's office about prescriptions about appointment times about you know every little thing that they need to do in order to make sure that their daily life can move forward as they need it to and so this work is specifically forwarding the first person perspective of the people who are living this day in and day out in a way that a lot of research has not yet done. It is specifically saying in a real way, the people who live this are experts 
that lived experiential expertise matters. And so let us make use of that lived experiential expertise and regard it as such rather than tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, hey, can you come over here and give us your opinion and then go away, please? To fully include them into the processes that are about their lives and not just include, but give them real power and control over the processes, the, the policies, the, the organizational structures to give them the ability to actually have influence within that space. And not just, again, some kind of inclusion and diversity. Oh, we have one disabled person and one black person and one woman and one trans person of color and you know, the, all of these things that are like check boxes. <laughs> and now we've done that and we're good. Instead of that, think truly about what it means to represent people to heed them and to understand their lived experiences. And again, I think real work has been done towards this, but I also think that more can be being done. Taking that work that has been done, that is being done, the people who are, who are doing really good, solid work and research in this space and saying, thank you for this work. How can I help build on it? What can I do to make sure that this work is, is heated, is in front of the people who can you know, use it to make the kinds of changes you would like to see made? For those of us, you know, some of us in the world who are coming to it later to do the work and do the research and then to ask those people who have done that work and done that research before us, what can we do to help? And like you said, it's so pervasive. And I think more people, like you said, are realizing how pervasive it is, but it's so pervasive. It's like technology, prison systems, military industrial complex, education, healthcare, pharmaceutical industry, food production industry, mental yep. health care. It's yep. like, it's everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, it, it is. It, it is threaded through literally every aspect of every part of our lives and whether it's you know race or whether it's gender or whether it's sexuality whether it's disability whether it's age whatever kind of marginalization it is and in, call it most cases it's it's some combination of all of those kinds of marginalization those things exist throughout the society in which we live you know, especially in terms of Western society, those things get embedded into how it is constructed, how it is reinforced, how it is carried out day to day. And with every action we take, whether small or large scale, that doesn't, you know, actively seek to try to push back against that, we kind of find ourselves folding within it at best, right? We find ourselves carried along by that pervasive systemic bias towards these kinds of oppression. But if we can counter that bias with a different kind of bias, again, no such thing as an unbiased action or creation. It's just the, the intentional kind of perspective that we want to bring to it. So if we can counter that with the intentional perspective that says we want to undo these biases that oppress, we want to put in perspectives put in biases that include, that open up this space for a wider array of you know, compassion, a wider array of kindness, a wider array of you know, mechanisms by which to lessen suffering, that we wanna say that we do actively oppose those perspectives which marginalize, those perspectives which oppress, those perspectives which, you know, will, if given the opportunity, hurt and kill people for how they're born. 
we would like those perspectives to go away entire. And we would especially like those perspectives to not be inscribed into the technologies that we use to live our daily lives. If we can consciously name these things, single them out, and work to proliferate a different way of thinking about them, a different way of thinking about what we want to do in the world, and to actively undo those damaging, prejudicial, marginalizing and oppressive perspectives, then we might be able to to make headway and move forward in a meaningful way. If there's anything I hope that people take from this, it's that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that fundamental understanding that we can't just like, we can't just try to make something different and hope for the best that it'll all turn out okay. We have to actively and intentionally work to dismantle the things we want to see dismantled. We have to actively try to build the things we want built. And even if we ourselves can't build them, we have to be able to point out what it is we want to see in the world, what it is we want to experience in the world, right? We have to be able to actively point out those things we want to experience and say, yes, that, and I will support that. And here's why. I didn't maybe don't have the tools to do it. I don't necessarily have the skills to bring it into fruition, but I can help other people understand why I think it's good. I can help other people understand why I think this old thing over here, this different, you know, the, the system that has existed for you know hundreds of years and has been subjecting people to prejudice and oppression. I can tell you why I think that's bad and needs to go away. And why I can point to possibly different combinations of older ways of thinking putting them in new combinations or putting them, you know, trying to learn from even just older ways from different societies, from different perspectives and saying, maybe we can try this again, or maybe we can try this with these modifications. Maybe we can take lessons from this over here and, and try something else, but we have to do it. Whatever we're doing, we have to do it intentionally. It has to be on purpose. <laughs> we might get real, real, real lucky and accident into a world of, justice and compassion but i kind of doubt it it takes work no uh, it's a really good point and, and like you said it's not enough to not be actively participating in these isms yourself but you have to actively work constantly to dismantle this there's a right. movement in psych psychoanalysis called decolonial psychoanalysis and that's yeah that's like what what we're working towards is like you know, whatever you can do, you can always work on yourself and you can always work in your immediate surroundings and in your yes. field. Like, yes. you know, you work in technology, I work in mental health. So how can I help in mental health to kind of dismantle this, you know? Yes, yes. no, that's exactly it. And like like the, the decolonial movement within psychoanalysis, within, you know, physics, within philosophy, uh, like there's this like the idea of decoloniality moving through multiple different fields in sciences and humanities and people asking that question of how do I pull these harmful systems actively out of the work that I do, the research in which I'm steeped, the discipline in which I'm trained. How do I actively pull those things out of myself so that I can work to pull them out of this larger system? Exactly. And, um, one of the things that really, when I worked in, I worked in bed Brooklyn, which is like lower socioeconomic, mostly black mm -hmm. neighborhood. And the way that my patients there were treated, it was so atrocious. And one of the most, there's many, many atrocities I could talk about. But one of the most shocking things was that you know, the, the, the prison system and the policing, they have quotas they have to meet, right? And literally at the end of every month, like 
a bunch of my patients wouldn't show up for a session. And it was because they were all getting like routinely arrested so that this police department could meet their quota for that period. Right. And it was right. often the same people because, and it was often the reason that the same people kept getting kind of tricked into it. Like they would get set up and tricked into it was because a lot of them had like developmental disabilities and they were getting right. tricked into these scenarios where they were getting arrested and, and locked up like every month. And, wow. and like the, the staff, I mean, everybody knew this was happening, but they're like, what can you do? That's just the way it is. And it, it's just like so horrifying. And I don't, I don't know. I know that people know that the prison system is bad and the policing is bad, but it's like really bad. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's pretty, that, that's pretty horrible. Um, like the, the fact that people who are known <laughs> within the prison system at that point, right. They're known within the the carceral system there's no way that you can continue to repeatedly arrest these people and not recognize that these are people who are in some cases going to be prone to being put into crisis right by being institutionalized in this way like these are people who are in a you know a relationship of care with you or with other doctors and are being ripped from that care by being incarcerated to meet a quota system within you know this this drastically oppressive you know horrific institutionalization you know, mechanism like that's that is deeply deeply upsetting it's so sick yeah it's just so it's just so sick and and another thing i'll mention is that you know all of my patients were diagnosed with like multiple really serious mental illness, like schizophrenia and bipolar, yeah. schizoaffective, like lots of psychotic disorders. And yeah. we're on like huge cocktails of medications and like, you know, talking to them every week, you know, all I saw was people that had, had a lot of trauma and a lot of trauma was because of these systemic issues. Like, yep. you know, having the kind of social system come into their homes and like you're saying, like, like monitor them and their family and their parents and uh, take them away from their parents when they were young or, uh, you know, going to prison is like a lot of a lot of traumatic incidents that would cause mm -hmm. mental health issues. And then being labeled with that as a problem and then giving all these medications. And it's just. Yeah. No, and uh, the the integration of you know how the the carceral system, the institutionalization system, feeds itself. You know that that kind of cyclical nature of you know, we're going to make you a problem so that we can label you a problem. Exactly. You know? uh, and then in labeling you a problem, we will reap the benefits of quote unquote fixing that problem for the rest of society. Exactly. Right. Like that is kind of at the core of how prison is thought of, how institutions um, writ large are thought of in the United States, right? Like I've, there's been decades of writing on the, the school to prison pipeline, right? And, and people are starting to, to recognize that, that that extends into mental health and it extends into, you know, not just school as we tend to think of it, but it extends into the foster care system. It extends into just how so many of, you know, so much of the, the, the state recognized, state organized systems of quote unquote correction uh, are constructed. These ideas that you're supposed to be a particular way and that if you don't fit into that particular way that we are you know expecting you to be then you are a problem and we will do what it takes to quote unquote fix it and we'll do what it takes to to make it go away um and if we can not correct you as it were <laughs> then then we will make you go away in some way shape or form we will hide you from the rest of the world um rather than recognizing that in many cases, what we think of as these kinds of you know, problems to be fixed are actually the results directly of social pressures and you know, lacks that have been put into place uh, either by happenstance or in many cases by direct choice by the, 
locality, the society or the culture in which these people live. Right. Like the way that, uh, older disabled people are thought of within Western society, within American society specifically as burdens in many cases, right. To be put away into some facility in many cases that exists specifically because the nature of um, our society as such pervasively predominantly is about making disability go away not making you know life easier for the disabled person not making their disability go away by giving them pervasive real structural access throughout society, but by making the appearance of their disability go away, by making, in extreme cases, them go away to, you know, make the disabled person no longer be present, to hide them off somewhere. And so this kind of extends to, okay, well, what happens when, you know, a bunch of people have said um, it's a, it's honestly, it's one of the quotes that I like best when thinking about this. Um, if we're lucky to live long enough, we will all be disabled by time, right? And what happens when people half realize that? Yeah, the kinds of ways that we tend to think about what nursing home facilities are for. And it's not necessarily about making life better for a person so much as it is about making life easier to live with the fact of an older person being an older person. And that the way that that gets thought about a lot of the time is, is troubling, but the answer tends to be, well, so just don't think about it. You know, like just, just kind of roll with it. And that doesn't really help. And it doesn't change, again, the, the structural, systemic, societal fact of, of why this is this way. And it's all part of the same piece. Because to go back to the very beginning of what we were talking about, you know, you think about what happened to older slaves when they were no longer viable for field work, if they happened to be able to live that long. If they managed to live long enough to be old, you know, at that point, they are disabled by work and by time and by a societal structure, which did not care for them, had no compassion for them, which made their bodies fundamentally unusable within the structure of the world for which it's supposed to be suited. They were enslaved, made to work themselves to death or, if not death, disability. And the disability itself stemmed from the fact that, well, you're supposed to be, quote unquote, supposed to be able to work a field. You're supposed to be able to hold a tool. You're supposed to be a pack animal. And if you cannot be that, then you are nothing. And you are worth nothing. And so that becomes this kind of fundamental disconnect for people who were enslaved, stolen from their homes, and in many cases, societies in which elders are supposed to be revered, in which they are supposed to be cared for, in which they're supposed to be learned from and put into places of deep care and respect within the framework of their society to a society which fundamentally says your elders are worthless. And if you are made old early by overwork and overuse, then you are worthless earlier. And so this is, again, it's encoded into every aspect of the society, this nature of what it means to, to lose your worth to no longer be able to have your, your bodily capability measure up. To no longer 
be able to to fit within the the techno social regime of work and worth and you know, the generation of profit or capital and to have all of that kind of be tied to what kind of body you have what kind of person you are what kind of thing you can do for the system writ large rather than being about and this will sound similar but it's different rather than being about what you can give to the community what you can give to the community doesn't have to be the work of your body it doesn't have to be about your physical capability it doesn't have to be about you being valued as a tool it can be any number of things and then most importantly the difference is that it can be defined by you in relation to the community the community ideally should be about multiple people individuals and groups coming together to sort out what they can do for each other together not being told because you have a certain type of skin you are worth less not being told because you have reached a particular age you are worth less not being told because your legs don't work the way we want them to you are worth less because you've gotten sick you are worth less that's that's not that's not community that's just oppression that's just a pervasive societal inscription of oppression and marginalization and it does lasting obviously centuries long harm to how we can relate to each other and how we can relate to literally anything that we make in the world both individually and societally Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Damian Patrick Williams, a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society. You can follow him on social media at Twitter and his writing at a future worth thinking about.com, as well as his Patreon, patreon.com slash wolven. That's W-O-L-V-E-N. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L Your support is greatly appreciated.
us at this moment is also that notion with energy my ex used to shoot was never invited small remembrances of data's medical and intellectuals will be missed being called or in these terms would be more precisely unconscious the surrealists can leave you in a place as well as the trickster it again this reflects daily narrative the space created creates the only true hope i know i should be there i've never been sometimes just a peak of vital deadlines this your behalf her no nonsense with who he shares many qualities pulls out of the scene and pluralizes this affinity marks a profundity interviewer desirable state burrows i have a huge love of mexico even though the spirits of a place and the place call brought to i just have to